Uh, what I'd like to do now without uh, uh, further delay is welcome our opening speaker, Paul Feldman, who uh, many of you will of course already know. Uh, he will speak to us today on the main theme of the conference, how libraries and their institutions can reimagine the way they work on the back of the wave of technological change which is sweeping over us. Paul has been the chief executive of JISC since October 2015. Uh, before joining JISC, he was an executive partner at Gartner UK and has also worked in knowledge-based IT organisations, including Thomson Reuters, Legal UK and the Intellectual Property Office. So I'll hand over to Paul. Thanks, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Just, uh, I'm going to try speaking from my iPad, but I do have paper, just in case. So I always don't, never trust technology. Anyway, it is a real pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, Anne asked me to challenge you on your future role. So I'm going to do that by actually challenging you on the way that technology might change higher education and to an extent leave it to you to actually work out what your role will be, though I will give you uh, some pointers. Anyway, many times over the years, we've seen the next big technical thing that was going to transform higher education. Uh, come and hit it, hit us. But by and large, students are pretty much taught in the same way they've always been. So if you take that painting, turn the paper into a laptop, you can probably keep the beards, hopefully change the gender, the gender balance in there a bit. That could be any lecture room up and down the country today, just about. So some, not much has changed while lots have changed. And of course, some shifts have happened. Flip learning is an, is an acceptable practice these days. Video recording of lectures is pretty commonplace. Uh, use of internet-based learning resources is, uh, is, 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 is a must. Uh, MOOCs, while might not having lived up to their wildest hypes, are really starting to be mainstream. They're starting to find their place. And you have this new concept of a SPOC, which I only heard about recently, small private online course. That are, that are really gaining quite a lot of excitement, uh, it, particularly in actually the venture capital uh, space, uh, which is about small courses for single universities that you pay for. Um, but, they're, but they're really about to change the world, so people say. Our own priorities for teaching are on this slide. They were derived from feedback from our members, and we have a, a senior committee on technology enhanced learning um, that is made up of, of, of key people from around universities uh, in around the UK who advise us on where they think we should be focusing. I'm not going to go through these uh, in particular. Uh, very happy to talk about them um, uh, outside of this, but, but these are the things that we're focusing on. And, and my talk will sort of come and touch on them here and there. Because we do think we're on the cusp of technology about to change the way that higher education works. The promise is about to be uh, fulfilled. Many of the winds of change are all pointing uh, in the right direction, whether they're governmental or technological, to create the changes, the, the, the opportunity and conditions for a sustained and systemic shift. Education is being driven by the same forces that are reshaping our world. The information revolution that started only a couple of days, decades ago has transformed other sectors in in unrecognisable ways. Uh, but it's not, a, it, I mean, if you just look at ha um, House of Fraser needing to shut down more than half of its stores at the weekend because of the internet revolution. Organisations are being impacted by this. Education hasn't really changed fundamentally. Uh, it's our time, though, we believe, to, to, to go with the flow uh, and actually make this change, make it work for our students so they can fulfil their ambitions. Now, we think the things that are particularly going to hit higher education are these three, uh, for the, 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 these three things, and they're the ones I'll spend some time on uh, today. Internet of Things, Machine Intelligence, uh, and Big Data. Um, and I'll come back and talk about them all uh, a bit. Uh, but but, but if, you, if you think that uh, these aren't sort of going to sort of make a difference, I mean, the artificial intelligence one I'll spend a bit of time on, but, but how can you avoid it? people talking about Alexa these days. Radio 4, uh, is, I can hardly uh, listen to Radio 4 without someone talking about how, how to get Google Home to do something that you can't quite, couldn't quite get it to do before. That is artificial intelligence, and it's changing the way that people 
uh, do things. And we do expect these things to play out in education. Now, we are helping the sector, as you'd expect, understand and exploit them, because if you haven't heard it before, our aim is for the UK to be the most advanced nation in the world to teach and research. And we believe this ambition is in our grasp in the UK, and then it's an ambition that we believe has added poignancy uh, with Brexit around the corner. And I, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this slide before. This is our view of how higher education is going to evolve into, well, through the use of uh, technology. Starting on the, the, your left-hand side, coming over to your right-hand side, today is the left-hand side, and that's learning analytics. You've heard about learning analytics. I'm not going to go into it uh, in any data. It is gaining traction. It is going from hype to real value add, whether it's to ensure that widening participation goals are met, ensuring that your bright, empowered students actually do fulfill their potential, or the possibility that we hope of actually finding indications of students who are, who, who are starting to suffer from mental health uh, issues and be able to get that intervention in uh, when it matters. Now, as with most technologies, learning analytics is going to be a lot slower than the hype to make its difference. But it is happening, and we believe it will be universal in the next 10 years. The next piece on here is that piece at the top of More Efficient Campus, the Internet of Things uh, applied in, into the campus. I'll, again, I'll come back and talk about that. But that's about putting instruments and sensors and doing stuff in your campus so you can actually get a much better idea of, of how it's used uh, and, and, and react to it. But for me, the really exciting parts uh, out of all of this, other than the artificial intelligence piece, is in this space. It's the use of data to improve the teaching process. Uh, and, and, and there's a real sort of star to be reached uh, here. Now, Formula One constantly, and for years, have used data on real-time telemetrics out of their cars to actually adjust the performance of their cars. Uh, in the last Olympics, you had the Olympic medal cyclists coming off of the track and, and actually thanking their data analysts for the 1% improvements that they were able to get that meant that they were the gold medal winners over uh, other nations. We believe that if we can find the right patterns, we can use that stu the student behaviour and their attainment data and, and their use of the campus and all the rest of it to help inform lecturers of what's working and what's not working. And if we can actually do that in the moment, a lecturer trying out an idea and actually uh, the students not really sort of grasping it, then actually we can, we can help in that moment that, that, that pedagogy get better. And in that way, we can help lecturers go from good uh, to great. And lastly, on our journey, uh, is the artificial intelligence uh, piece. Artificial intelligence in teaching. Predictive an analytics and adaptive learning to personalise the learning journey of students is the area we think it will have uh, a, a key uh, use, but some other uses. Now, while we're seeing really some initial examples, the real promise and capability still lies in the future. We're seeing a lot of hype about artificial intelligence hitting the world today and, and machine learning. Let's actually just be uh, clear with this. There's the, the intelligence there is a misnomer. There is nothing sentient about artificial intelligence. It is just a code that is able to adapt to, to, to what comes at it. So it's self-adapting and self-learning, uh, but it is not uh, intelligent. For some years, people have talked about a concept of the singularity. Uh, it's that point where actually machines become more intelligent than us, uh, and, and actually maybe we become slave to the machine rather than uh, the other way around. Personally, I'm really optimistic uh, about, about the future, about the future of jobs and about the future of mankind uh, in, in this world. For me, artificial intelligence is just another tool for us to improve our lot once we've moved through the particular revolution uh, that's going to hit us with this. And it's another step on freeing us, people up, to do what we're best at, the human condition. But how might this be used in uh, teaching? Well, the most immediate uh, example is adaptive learning. And those are real sort of... Uh, examples that people are using. We do see examples of it today, and, and it is something like the VLE, uh, learning from the student's preferred learning style, from the way they use it, from what they're good at and, and what works and what doesn't work, to help and, and, and support them with different techniques and adapting, adapting the material that is in front of them to actually sort of uh, help them on their learning journey. So it is, it is literally not a, just a one-size-fits-all. It's a very personalised journey for the students 
uh, taking in their knowledge. So yeah, rather than shoehorning them to a lecturer's way, it is, it is the university actually adapting into the student. It's starting to hit in, in, in secondary education, uh, particularly over in the US. I think those are, are, more, are more school results than higher education results, but there are some there. But we do expect it to be prevalent in, in tertiary education in the next 10 years uh, or so. So what about other aspects where robot lecturers might take over? There are many, there are many different opportunities uh, for, this to, for, for them to take on the burdensome aspects uh, of teaching. For example, we all know about plagiarism detection systems. All of your universities will be using them. Well, it's only a small step for those systems to actually do the marking on the assignment. It really is only a small step. Um, though I do hope that we will always use people to really take a review, to understand where's the inspirational pieces, where are those creative elements uh, within those assignments. I'm sure machines will be able to detect those novel thoughts and the creative ones, but to be able to delve into them, to be inspired by their import and to spot the world-changing ones, that, I believe and hope, will be remain our domain for some time to come. Now, in this way, we see students becoming more self-sufficient in their learning, guided by intelligent technology. Contact hours will now focus on ensuring they understand, can critically, uh, can critically critique, think, debate, and so on. In this way, our lecturers evolve from teaching knowledge to imparting wisdom. Or maybe it's back to the days of the Greek philosophers. Now, let's, let's move on from those particular aspects and add to all of these capabilities the use of augmented and virtual reality, commonly known as a, a generic of, of, of uh, mixed reality. For those less familiar with those terms, augmented reality is where you use technology to overlay uh, a, a vision in, in, in real life. So if you take that top left-hand yeah, left corner, that's an app that we built for the Leeds College of Music where you can actually put your iPad, hold it over a mixing desk, and it shows you how to use that mixing desk in an interactive uh, way, and it truly is iPad driven. That is now a key part of the uh, curriculum uh, in the College of Music. And why is it valuable? Well, they don't have that many mixing desks, they're in high demand, and actually teaching students how to use them and reminding them is, 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 is actually not the best use uh, of, of their time. So it accelerates uh, that, that learning. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, that's another great example, another great form of augmented reality. That is augmented reality, and it has great application in teaching, and I'll show you one a bit later on. Virtual reality, on the other hand, is where you actually immerse yourself in a whole different world, a world that only exists in the headsets. And these headsets can, can, you can buy for £10. This isn't some really ridiculous, expensive technology. You can go online... Use, you, you can go and actually I've seen them in garages, petrol garages, you can buy a headset for £10 that you put your phone in and you have a virtual, rea a virtual reality uh, experience. We know these technologies have great applicability into teaching and there are some great examples starting to appear that I'll come on to. Now, and I'm sure that virtual reality is another technology that's on the cusp of adding great value into higher education. In many ways, it could have been made for it. The ability to immerse students in environments that no longer exist and get them to experience situations close to real life. The ability to allow them to learn skills safely, but in spaces that feel real, and the ability to explore on their own. And let's look at a few examples. Here, there's a couple of slides from a Brazilian-led organization, uh, called, uh, one of them's called Domus, you can uh, Google it. Now, I mean, one of the problems they have is being in South America, there's not, a lot of ancient, there's not a lot of ancient Roman civilization there for their students to experience. They do have uh, the Incas, uh, but, but, but that's, that's different, different generation, as it were, different era to the sort of uh, remains that we have over here in, uh, in, in our part of the world. So to get their students to experience this, virtual reality is a tremendous way. This is a way of walking for that's Palmyra. Uh, so being able to walk through Palmyra uh, and see that. And this one is uh, not so much a ruin, but a recreation of a Roman villa, which they can walk through. And remember, they're immersed. It's a 360-degree uh, experience. They can immerse, and it talks to you as you walk through it and explains to you uh, what, what they're seeing. 
Now, in every subject, we can imagine uh, what similar experiences could be like. To be on the stage in the middle of a Shakespeare production, to even have it staged in Elizabethan times, possibly at the Globe, is possible. To have it played out and then stopped, and then you and your fellow students can discuss what's actually happening at that moment. What did Shakespeare mean? What are the actors doing? This is actually possible with virtual reality, and that sort of interaction uh, is possible. Another example could be flying down through the structure of an atom to really understand uh, what's happening and how they interact. Or maybe a real nirvana, anything that can help explain the theory of relativity by actually experiencing it. Here's a different example. This is a real example of using virtual reality to give lab skills. Uh, and again, a bit like the augmented reality one of teaching a mixing desk, being safe and learning how to use a lab is, 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 is a big uh, step. And if we can actually accelerate that, the use of virtual reality, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a great way to actually accelerate students' learning, uh, as it were. And again, that's, that's real. Uh, and, and this next one, I think, is one of the more amazing ones. Now, this is Professor Shafi Ahmed of King's College. Uh, and he is, uh, he's doing a surgery and is actually wearing a, a, a headset. He is broadcasting, with the patient's permission, that surgery to the world using virtual reality. Students around the world are experiencing what he's experiencing. Uh, I, I mean, uh, he's doing that as much for, 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 for knowledge passing uh, as, as much as pedagogy. But I just think that's an amazing uh, experience uh, on its own, happening quite now, happening now. Now, why technology is changing our pedagogy, our lecture theatres haven't necessarily changed. That's actually uh, in Edinburgh, um, and, and, and uh, it looks pretty much like that still. Um, and you will recognise that, I think, I think that's Huddersfield, but you'll recognise that from your own institutions. That could be, again, in most universities up and down the land, they haven't changed. But technology is changing, our does need to change our lecture theatres and will be changing our lecture theatres. We will need those big showpiece theatres uh, for, for, for students to come and uh, worship at the, at the feet of, of, of the masters, uh, as it were, um, and, and for them to be able to impart their knowledge uh, in, in ways that has always been done. But the real, regular, normal pedagogy will be in, in, in rooms like this. This is our sticky campus room, but I've seen examples of this in your institutions up and down the land. This is, this is the next future uh, of, 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 of lecture theatres. And we'll think about in a minute what might be coming uh, after that. Because actually, uh, that's, that's still quite static. That is a room in our institution. What about interacting outside of the institution in lectures? Now, here's a, here's a great example, a real example. That is Habib University in Pakistan in its first ever Global uh, Connect video conference with, that happens to be Pitsa University, where they're, getting, uh, where, where they're sort of ex, ex, exchanging experiences on religion and modernity, a great piece of pedagogy for both. Uh, institutions. Now, I use video conferencing uh, all the time. Uh, it, 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 you, you, hardly, uh, you can hardly do anything in, in JISC without a video conference. Uh, and, and so why wouldn't we be using these types of technologies uh, to help in pedagogy? But, but there are other ways uh, to do this type of remote participation. So this, this is Jade, Jade uh, in Durham. This was actually a, a still from the One Show uh, last year. Uh, you, can't, you can no longer get it on iPlayer, which you should be thankful for, because it had Benny from ABBA on it on the same time. So. But, but what she's doing, that, that robot there goes to school. She can't go to school, but that robot goes to school, and she can actively take part in the lessons using that robot. And, the, and, 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 and that's, a, that's a great example of technology making a difference. But how else can we use video conferencing type, te type technology to really make a difference to the way that we interact uh, with each other? Because uh, I think we can enrich our student learning experiences and get them used to the world of work through video conferencing, which incidentally, a lot of them told us in our last year digital student experience survey, they don't think you do nearly enough to prepare them uh, for with the digital skills they need. As, actually, as well as that, uh, earning export does, because the students do not need to be here in the UK. But that's video conferencing, which is today's technology. Holograms are just around the corner. That is, a, I know it doesn't come up too well 
in the slide, but that, that's, that's a, real, a real hologram appearing. So I'll be appearing in 3D uh, in a room. Uh, now, this, this is the future. Uh, uh, it's certainly not today. That's way too bulky in one person uh, uh, appearing as a hologram. But that's not far off the size of technology we had when video conferencing first started. We can now all video conference on our phones. Uh, holograms will come. The technology will get miniaturized. It will become affordable. And then what happens when we can uh, uh, do that? What happens when people can actually walk through remotely and experience in the, in the same way that you're experiencing and so on? But a much more real-term example uh, is this. This is back to HoloLens. This, 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 this uh, person here, he can't move. He, he, he is literally, he, he's, he's in a very, very big uh, wheelchair and he's actually based here in Brighton. He lives here in Brighton. He's using HoloLens to actually beam his lecturer into his living room. So he can interact with his lecturer in his living room using HoloLens. Maybe not the, the most fantastic of technology of, 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 of image, but, it, but it's real and it's happening and it can happen. Uh, and what does that mean? How is that going to change the future of higher education? Moving on and back to Internet of Things. This is an area where we don't nearly know enough about in terms of how it's going to uh, change things. We're just starting on our co-design program on this. We've been consulting uh, with you and your colleagues for the past year on what you're doing and how Internet of Things may change your campuses. Um, and we're really starting to scope up what we're going to do in this space. And here's all, here's all the areas that we think it's relevant uh, uh, to you. Uh, it will, we do believe it will make a difference, uh, and, 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 the, and not, just in, 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 not just in these ways, but actually to the student themselves. Did you know, for example, that carbon dioxide levels build up uh, in a lecture room uh, dur during the lecture, uh, to the point where actually concentration suffers? So, so now you've actually got an excuse for nodding off this afternoon, by the way. Uh, and, and actually, I'm pleased I'm on first. But actually, a sensor measuring carbon dioxide levels and then adjusting the air quality will make a real difference to your students' uh, attention and, as a result, hopefully, uh, uh, success. Now, many, as I said, many universities are thinking about Internet of Things. Um, and this is the, uh, an area I particularly recommend you as librarians uh, do some thinking. Should you add sensors to your books so you can track them and track what happens to them and the way that they're used? Should you track students' movements in your learning spaces? Um, what else can you do to make sure that students are able to most easily find out uh, what they need in your spaces by integrating the library and their devices? They're all carrying devices. You can track their devices and lots and lots of other ways. We're intending to extend our, our learning data hub. That's this piece here. This is where, if any of you do, are doing our learning analytics or, or, or have been part of our pilot, your data ends up in there. It's cloud-based, but that's irrelevant. Your data ends up there. We're intending to extend that to include Internet of Things data. And that, in that way, we can bring in student, student attendance, student attainment, use of the library, all the other things that we do learning analytics with, with much more... Uh, soft data about how they're in the campus, what they're, what, what they're doing, what they're not doing, and then hopefully from that be able to take the learning analytics space uh, to, to, to even the next, to, 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 a, to a new level. And I, and, and, I think there, and I think somewhere in here is the real solution to really being able to, to distinguish uh, a student heading into mental health issues. Learning analytics doesn't have a big difference between a student not attending lectures because they're uh, loving the university experience and they, they actually can't be bothered to attend lectures from a student who actually is starting to get depressed and isn't going to leave their room. But, but, but the Internet of Things, the sensors in the campus, will detect a difference. I can't tell you what that difference is, but we will be able to see the difference uh, when, when we're starting to collect that data. And as a result, we'll be able to help uh, with, with some interventions. It's, not a, it, it's just a, an indication that there's an issue. If by itself, it isn't going to uh, solve the problem. Anyway, so will all of these things, will all of these new teaching technologies and pedagogy change your role? Almost certainly. And almost certainly should you be brave enough to grab the opportunities they open up for you. 
Have you thought about what your role will be with books and assignments published as virtual reality? It's going to come. How are your learning co commons going to cope with holograms wandering around? Um, what's your role in ensuring students get knowledge? If the focus of lecturers is on wisdom, what's your role in, in, in ensuring that they get the knowledge and have the knowledge they need in the right way? Amazon now treat their, learning, their, their artificial intelligence systems, their ma machine learning systems, as employees. The managers think about the system uh, in the same way they would think about an employee. Have you thought about how you're going to handle the robots that become your colleagues in the future? Well, let's move on to research. Similar space, for at its heart, we do similar things to our historic forebears, such as Rog Rog Roger Bacon here. They would certainly recognise the method and philosophy, uh, even as some of the things we now do in research may seem a bit otherworldly to them. One of the key changes over the eons has to be the sheer breadth and depth and scale of research we now do, uh, and the challenge for any one person to hold all that knowledge in their head. You know that. These are our own research challenges. I'm not going to go through them. They're there. We've got plenty of people here that's happy to talk uh, to you uh, uh, about them. Uh, but, but much of our work is, help, is, is focused on helping you help your researchers find, use, preserve, match, and, ex and synthesize all of this stuff. Uh, and actually, here are some of the challenges that we think that we need uh, to be focused on these, as, as, as JISC, but they're your challenges uh, as well. Uh, and again, we, we, we're not saying that's a complete list. They're the ones that we are working on. And as always, we're really happy to get your, your feedback on it. But again, I don't particularly want to spend too much time because that's today. Some of the things that are coming up, and again, I'll really quickly skim over these. We're starting to think about what a research commons looks like for the UK, a shared service for sharing, preserving, finding, discovering uh, research data, resources, uh, and, and, and managing uh, all of that. Um, and uh, we've got a breakout session tomorrow, I believe, so many of you know Neil Jacobs. Uh, and the crew, so they, they'll be talking to you about how, re, how our RDSS system, which is on the next slide, uh, and, and all of this could come together and how it all interacts with open access. So go and talk to them uh, tomorrow, because uh, I, I just wanna, I want to move on from the near term to some of the more further term stuff. That's our RDSS system, which some of you are piloting, so that's, that's real, and it's all it's looking to address the same sorts of issues. Just a few other things that are sort of something just to raise your eyes about. So even in Brexit times, we're not an island, despite what some folk would have us be, by the way, but especially in a research sense, as you know. Uh, and, and research is increasingly global. I don't need to tell you that. And, but as we know, allegiances are more to the discipline sometimes than into an institution or even a country. And this is the world in which EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, uh, is starting to happen. It's happening now, and if you haven't got your head around it, I would encourage you to. Now, while it's an EU initiative, uh, it is aimed at global research, and, and it is aimed at making open science real uh, in Europe. We do believe that we will be, no, no matter how, what, how we appear in the Horizon Europe follow-on to Horizon 2020, we will still be able to access some of this because the intent is for it to be uh, global. But influencing it is a, a, a key piece. Now, we're deep into helping influence things uh, as it stands. Uh, the Secretariat is actually one of my people has been a key member of the Secretariat, for example. And here are the six lines of action uh, in the EOS principles. You can go online and find these. They're not, um, uh, they're, they're not JISC, despite uh, uh, the style. These, these things you can find online. Again, it's worth your while understanding them. They will become the way that European research is done uh, in, in, in the medium term. Now, you overlay on all of this the multiple conversations that are happening about open access and open science here in the UK today. Now, I'm not going to go into the labyrinthine negotiations that are around there. And again, you can, uh, you can tackle uh, Neil on that uh, tomorrow afternoon. But I do want to spend a bit of time on data because I think this is something that we need to think about for the future. It's a space that is changing quite rapidly. We do need to solve the research data problems, as you know, not just so that you meet research uh, funder mandates and not just for the reproducibility issues that we talk about, but also because the mass of data that we're building 
it's going to form a, as valid a store of human knowledge as the archives of the British Museum, the British Library, the Library of Congress, and so on. And we believe that, uh, that, that there is a, uh, an in, some really important uh, trends going to come out of here. I mean, we, you, as you know, many, many disciplines already store their data um, as, as disciplines rather than as nations, uh, as a matter of course. EBI in Cambridge has a copy of all the sequenced uh, genomes. It's there uh, for use. And what we expect at some point is research to start looking across all of these data repositories, institutional, national, and discipline-wide, and actually giving, for, giving rise to new forms of research, uh, not far off from meta-studies uh, that are now sort of uh, uh, more commonplace. Mining research data within and across disciplines to find new insights. And that is a key goal of the European Open Science Cloud, by the, by the way. We also suspect this will give rise to new research analytics and develop new metrics and analysis methods to assess the quality and effectiveness of research and to better support future research. Here's, this is a, a tool called Datazar. Active research and discovery are, are, are parts of areas of promise for new technology. There seems to be interesting opportunities for more intelligent and user-friendly tools to support researchers in the act of carrying out research. For, for example, here, collecting, preparing, and analyzing data. I say that's the data is our, uh, Mendeley have developed a tool that um, is going to help researchers organize and manage their research data as they produce it. We know that we need to pay more attention to this in JISC as it's the key to ensuring that we get the data from researchers in a way that makes it easy for the researchers, but also so it can be uh, reused as part of that web of data. There's also some interesting startups in the discovery space. This one is Causally, which helps researchers discover causation across a corpus of research papers. Uh, and this one, which is Apertio, I think that's how it's pronounced, which aims to make it easier to find and reuse open data. But raising our sights even further, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence offers promise here. Could AI be applied to make discovery of research papers and data at least a partially automated task for, for researchers? And here, automation can transform research. Whether it's artificial intelligence helping to analyze data in entirely novel ways, or robots carrying out automated experience, uh, experiments, or just smart tools that gather contextual data in an easier and more robust way. All these things are already occurring. And as I'm sure you've read on that slide by now, who would ever have thought that toothpaste can fight malaria? Well, a robot did. As librarians, have you thought how you work with robot researchers? Um, while we can divert ourselves amusingly to think about the weird science uh, type human machine interactions that might come out of that, what I mean is much more, how are you gonna give your robots access to other research materials? How's the descriptions gonna work? How do we preserve findings we don't understand? At what point are the outputs of a machine in the arts and humanities a composition, a piece of art worthy of preservation? And do we now need to start preserving the code of the robot that produced it? Many, many more questions that I could come up with and very few answers. But before you accuse me of a flight of fancy here, look at this. Sony have set up a grand challenge to have an artificial intelligence machine capable of uh, winning a Nobel Prize in biomedical science. What's your place when that happens? The web of data I mentioned above can only help further opportunities to use AI to generate novel insights. But one of the really interesting questions around AI is whether humans will understand how the machine arrived at these insights that they develop. We will be able to follow their thinking, and if we don't understand how the insight was arrived at, does that lead to problems in using it? Will this re release researcher time to spend on more high value analysis and thinking rather than repetitive experimentation? Or will it lead to fewer human researchers? Ideally, it'll lead to more exciting research for humans with the boring stuff taken by machines. But what does that mean for postdocs and PhD students? And this brings me back to people. All these great opportunities to reinvent higher education to empower our lecturers to focus on wisdom and inspiring their students, to drive research into places mankind couldn't dream about uh, in the past, to reorient researchers to finding insights and managing the web of machine-led discoveries. 
All these opportunities will come to naught if we can't help our lecturers, researchers and students make the leap to this, to me, exciting future. We know that managing this change is key to ensuring we have a, 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 an exciting future, not a dystopian one. You, yourselves, librarians, need to change and reorient yourselves. Many of you are moving in the right direction to support the student experience. That's only the first step. You, can learn, you need to learn to learn and embrace these new opportunities and that's as a stimuli of change in your institutions. You can be custodians of these technologies, becoming guardians of them, if not trainers of our, of our artificial intelligence workforce. The future will happen. This future, in my view, will be exciting, and it will liberate us, people, to do our best. We will still have students graduating. We will still have researchers researching. But what, the, but what they learn and where they take mankind are to places that we can only glimpse today. What I'm sure of is that this will free us up to find the things that take us to the stars, take us into the deepest parts of the oceans, find the cures for the worst diseases and create art and music more beautiful than before. Thank you. Oh, I'm happy to stand here to take the questions. Absolutely, yes. my head around managing robots and then working with robot researchers. <laughs> I hope you've got some answers. <laughs> um, so we have some time for questions from the floor. Could you say who you are and where you're from, please? And the mic will be round. Uh, my name is Lisa. I uh, work here in Brighton. I'm from the University of Brighton. Hi there. Um, and I wanted you to just talk about the commercial conditions under which libraries would have to subscribe to and manage the technology that you've presented to us today. <laughs> Liam in the room. <laughs> uh, in many ways, nobody yet knows. We haven't, we haven't really uh, got our head around uh, that because we don't yet quite know what it's going to look at. Um, a lot of the, uh, I mean, and, and there, are, there are the commercial solutions uh, for this, but most of the outputs are, that I've seen that are really meaningful to education uh, are really coming out of universities. So they're generally done, I think, in more creative commons. Um, but publishers are starting to get their heads around this, and, and I don't see why uh, we wouldn't do a GIST collections for, for a lot of this stuff in the way that we've uh, done it uh, for others. So I'm hoping that we will be able to uh, manage it, but, but, but in many ways we just don't know. And certainly uh, any, any, any pieces of artificial intelligence, the intellectual property in that, I think is, is people will exploit that commercially. Uh, and it's going to be an interesting negotiation when Liam gets to it. One here. There's one here in the front. Hi, Kate Price, Queen Mary, University of London. Um, I'm interested in your view. Uh, at what are the critical factors that turn something that might be seen as a novelty into something that becomes a way of life? What is that inflection point? What are the dimensions that move it from the, this is interesting, to this is what we do now? It's the new normal. Oh, uh, I have to say, if, if I could really answer that question, I could make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, my own, my own feeling is that uh, technologies that... Technology, te technologies that make a difference to individuals. At the end of the day, there's so much money in us as consumers um, and, in, and, in, and in the big business. Uh, that's, 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 that's the real pull. So um, that, that, that's where... So if, if someone can work out a way of developing a piece of technology that makes a difference to each of our lives every day, uh, and it, it actually does make that uh, difference, that's the first step. Actually getting it into people's hands, that's the job of, 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 of marketing. And that's, that, that's the je ne sais quoi that I don't think uh, we can do, uh, with, 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 that we can uh, predict. So it's a lot of the, the, the great things that have come about have, have come about in the past uh, quite through serendipity. Now, I think one of the key differences, I think, is the internet companies are starting to push things and are some of the richest organizations in the world. And so we're able to put the marketing pounds behind making things happen. So, so things like uh, Alexa. Uh, Amazon can actually invest 
in making that happen uh, and making it real and getting it into all of our homes. And once it's in our homes, it will make a shift and then people will, and that, that gives us a space to actually sort of uh, be able to then use that same technology uh, elsewhere. Amazon, again, is rich enough to be able to invest in it in its own uh, operations to get the price of deployment uh, down and the skills uh, down. But I, I, I don't have that answer. I think there is, like, like in most innovations, making a lot of bets and some will work, some won't work. And that ability to fail fast, learn, uh, try something, uh, learn what works, expect, accept that a lot of it isn't gonna work and move on uh, is, is, is the only way to do this at this time. Sorry, it's not a great answer. But this one. There was another question. Yeah. Hi, yeah. I'm Sue White from University of Huddersfield. I suppose this is a comment, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I think yeah, a lot of us are currently working on digital strategies for our institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what you've described there is kind of what we'd all love to have in the future, but getting there is incredibly challenging, I think. And a lot of us have you know, legacy IT systems that don't interoperate. The data that we're all collecting doesn't all um, match up, you know, so we're not actually able to do all the analytics work that we need. And if you're talk talking about artificial intelligence and chatbots and things, you've got to have all the underlying infrastructure in place. And I think one of my challenges in my institution is how to convince the really senior management of the millions of pounds potentially that has to be invested in your infrastructure in order to enable all this to happen. So I just wondered if you had any comment on that. I, I would agree with that. Um, I, 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 I have a sort of a s s set of words that I use to challenge senior leaders and it's not far uh, off that. So I think senior leaders need to take this much more seriously than they are. We are starting to see many universities starting to grab the digital strategies, but it, uh, it is the digital strategy for today and yesterday, not the digital strategy uh, for tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and I think they need to be raising their eyes uh, a bit more. Um, but, but, but I agree, I mean, to, to, to be fair to all those leaders, just being able to get to today uh, for many universities is, is a challenge and is big investments at, at a time that uh, they need to be investing in lots and lots of other things uh, as well. And uh, while we've got some great IT people in higher education, we don't have nearly enough uh, people who are prepared to work at the rates that we can afford in higher education versus than the rates of the city. So there are, there are, there are an awful lot of challenges uh, to, get to, to getting there. Uh, that's what I'm saying. This isn't going to happen tomorrow. It will happen. Uh, but it will happen behind uh, a lot of the rest of society. Um, and, and, and in the meantime, we just have to uh, ah, soldier on. It is, 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 is sounds a bit defeated. There's an awful lot of value that can be gained uh, in the meantime. There's an awful lot of uh, trialing that needs to be done uh, in the meantime. None of us really know how artificial intelligence uh, will change pedagogy. There's, I, I think we can do those sorts of tests uh, much lower cost with sort of data uh, that we have to hand. Um, we, we, uh, uh, but it's not going to transform, that by itself isn't going to transform uh, the institutions. But, uh, but it will come, and I just think it'll be, uh, as I say, I think it's a, probably a 10-year minimum sort of transition. But, but Anne asked me to start to, to challenge you for that future. It's coming. Hi, Mary Dawson, um, Sheffield Hallam. Um, you've talked about Amazon quite a bit as an example and mm -hmm. um, treating systems as employees. I wonder if you think there are any sort of um, ethical considerations about the danger of treating employees as systems or robots. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, hopefully we don't. Hopefully we don't go there. Though, though it is. It, is, it was a worry when I heard Amazon talking about this. I heard the managing direct, UK managing director uh, talking about this. And I sat there and thought, I had some of those same uh, questions myself. It was my, my human side was sort of bristling against this concept. But then when you think about it, you think, well, yes, why wouldn't you uh, uh, do that? Um, I, I, I mean, I think there are, real, there are real ethical issues in a lot of this that we've 
only just started to scratch uh, the surface uh, on. Uh, what I do worry is the potential for different types of the next generation of sweatshops. For example, that machine can operate 10 times faster than you in, um, uh, I know cataloging those books, a crap example, but you know what I mean. Why can't you get, do it at that speed? Uh, so I think we need, to, that's why I think it's important that we as humans reinvent ourselves. We, we, it, it's madness to try and compete at those sort of low, that, that, that low re repetitive type value task. And, and the key difference with artificial intelligence is that uh, over previous technologies is that it's starting to automate the tasks, the white collar tasks, as opposed to the, the blue collar tasks. And we don't have the, generally, generally we retrain blue collar people when, they're, when, when, when a machine comes and means that you, 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 you uh, have a machine that produces the stirt, rough stirt rather than the hand stitching. We retrain uh, people. I don't think we've thought about how to retrain professionals into whole new skills. Uh, to be fair, I think the government is, knows that that problem is there and they're starting to think about it more generally in the world. The sways of accountants and, um, and lawyers, paralegals, that might, no, might not be needed in that future. How do you retrain them? Uh, because they're, 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 they still have valid skills. And the same will apply into librarians. What jobs do you do that you won't need to do in the future because the machine uh, can take it away in ways that you can't imagine? And what is your role? Uh, within, within that. I don't think it's going to be fewer librarians because most of you don't have nearly enough uh, to do what you're being, up, that's being asked of you. So it is about reinventing. But in terms of how, uh, how, how, how you do that, I think it's not, I, I think Amazon have, have, have gone a bit too far uh, on that. Uh, I understand it's about, it is about productivity uh, for them. And for me, I think the thing is uh, to treat those things as, as tools. Um, uh, but value what they do and, and not try and compete with them is the way that I think uh, is, is the best way for all of us in the future. So one at the back there. We have time for one, yes, one more question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, AJ Birmingham Burr from Birmingham City University. Um, in, in the IT world, we're very much encouraged to think of digital strategy not as being about how we use digital technologies to enable our existing strategies or to do what we already do better, but actually to enable us to do things that we could never do before at all, i.e. brand new, I don't know whether you can use the word business model in this context, but, but brand new organisational model of delivery. It was very interesting to hear you talk about lots of uh, different IT trends, which I think they, they are trends, but they were all very much around how we use technology to do what we already do better rather than doing something completely new and different. So I'm thinking about technologies like blockchain or frictionless UX or things like that. Have you got any thoughts on, on that, on like brand new models for something completely different that we can't do right now? Um, I, I, I think there are, there are a lot of interesting technologies around that could fundamentally disrupt. But there's, there's a piece around, well, if they actually disrupt that much, uh, do you need a university at all? Uh, there, is th there is that. Um, and, 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 and my own experience is that actually life doesn't get disrupted that much. Um, uh, that, um, uh, th that actually, if, if, if technology does sort of automate an awful lot of the professional skills, uh, and we get to that concept of everybody having a basic wage. You're going to need universities and colleges even more because people will be able to uh, spend a lot more time thinking about the universe, uh, as it were, and how do we help them. Um, I, I, I mean, things like blockchain, I think, are, uh, are, are a technology looking for a solution. So I think there's a lot of that type of uh, thing around. I don't, personally, I don't believe... I've yet to see uh, anything blockchain blockchain is going to solve that we can't solve uh, in other ways. So I'm, I'm sceptical. I'm, I'm a blockchain sceptic. doesn't mean we're not playing with it to see. Uh, I just think there's way more hype in blockchain than is needed. Uh, it's, and, and it's nothing like a secure. There have been, Bitcoin has been hacked more than once. People have lost fortunes on Bitcoin. And so it is not this, it's, it's way overhyped. Uh, that doesn't mean micro-credentialing isn't important. And I think it's things like that that will can fundamentally change the structure of universities, not so much the technology, but is that piece around, well, I'm, I'm in lifelong learning. I don't want to, I've, 
I've done, done my degree, I've done my masters, I've now got to retrain because I'm a paralegal and I'm not needed anymore. Uh, going back to do another four year course isn't what anybody wants to do. They need to get micro credentials. I want to go and do a course on, uh, I, I, know, I can't name it, but I want to go on, on, on something, some new professional skill. And I want that to get recorded. I want to record it in a way that when I have to do my next course, uh, it can all build up not far off where the European University uh, used to do things. Now, you don't need blockchain to be able to do those micro, man manage those micro credentials. It, 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 it's one way uh, to do it. But the fundamental thing is today we can't even do credit transfer. Um, uh, the, the, the issues around uh, micro credentials aren't technical, they are do you trust? that university over there and, its ability and, 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 and the way that it's actually sort of done the course and, and examined uh, the course to be able to trust the credit that comes out of that university. That, that's the fundamental question there and it's not a technical question. Uh, it's, it's, there's a million and one other questions around that that, te that, isn't, that isn't about technology. I think we've run out of time. We have, thank you Paul. I think you've set us some challenges both for the here and now which I note, <laughs> as well as for the future. And that's been a great opener for this conference. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. Welcome.